This week, a class on conspiracy culture in American history. Indiana University professor Stephen Andrews discusses how conspiracy theories have changed over time. Here he notes some of the conspiracies around 9-11. So many of these um, claims about 9-11, that there were planted explosives, that there was no plane that hit the Pentagon, moving to levels of Luciferianism, that these were these were actually missiles and not planes with holographic planes around them, depending on how far you want to stretch the kind of unreality and the, the bounds of reality that they're going to use. More with Professor Stephen Andrews in a moment. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, I have been, this is my second year. I also did some other things with the museum. I like to thank everybody at the 9-11 Museum. They're fantastic, as you all know. Um, so easy to work with. Gilda Lehrman is fantastic. The entire staff is wonderful. Um, it, had, it hit me last year, and I thought that maybe this year it would be different, that I hadn't, I had already experienced the 9-11 Museum, and now it would become old hat being in this space. And it's not. Right. This space, as you know, as well as anybody over the last five days, is is hallowed ground. And it is a powerful place and a hard place, in a sense, to do something as mundane as give a lecture. So I'm going to do my best to do that. And I say that because some of the things we're going to talk about are weird. Some of them are funny. Some of them are scary. Some of them are gross. Um, And I don't want any of that to seem disrespectful to the space that we're in. Um, Nothing we can do, you know, as Lincoln said, can unhallow this ground that is hallowed. But I do want you to know that I'm cognizant, as I'm sure you are, of the space that we're in, but still have to do the task we have before us. Um, My name is Steve Andrews, as Ed said. I had a great pleasure of working with Ed and continue to work with him. Um, I'm from a small southern town in Florida, uh, Brandon, outside of Tampa. I was raised as a fundamentalist, evangelical Southern Baptist. I say that because We will talk at some points, um, conspiracy culture interacts with American religion, and we have to talk about that. And when we do, I don't want it to ever seem that I'm being um, derisive or um, joking about religious things. I think they're crucially important both to me personally and professionally as a historian, Um, but we need to talk about some of those issues. But I'm just laying that out that the place that I'm coming from is not a place from outside of religion, but within it. And so any criticisms that I'm making or comments that I'm making are from a person who is part of a culture that you're also critiquing. Um, when, I was in, oh, when I was in graduate school, um, I was working on spiritualism. I'm not sure how familiar you are with spiritualism, but spiritualism was the popular belief in the 1850s that it was possible to talk to the spirits of the dead. And it becomes a kind of cultural um, phenomenon of people having seances, and it goes through the 1860s of talking to the dead and the Fox sisters in 1848. And the thing that fascinated me was I was well familiar with the academic work on religion and folk belief, things like Keith Thomas's uh, religion, uh, uh, religion and the decline of magic, right? Which is that as we become more modern in the Enlightenment, our beliefs in things like witches and monsters and fairies are diminishing. And yet in the 1850s, at a time of steamships and the telegraph, when we're laying transatlantic telegraph cables that link New York and London, people in America and in other parts of Europe, but particularly in America, are being fascinated and deeply believing in the existence of talking to spirits. How do you have both things? How do we move in this direction towards modernity, establishing the Erie Canal and the steamship and the telegraph, and at the same time, this culture is also looking back to beliefs that would not be out of place in Salem in the 1690s, right? So, but I want to talk also, so keep that in the back of your head. I want to talk about, when I say conspiracy theorist, or we talk about American conspiracies, what are some of the kind of conspiracies that we're talking about? What are conspiracies that you know of in the United States? Yes, ma'am. We did not land on the moon. We did not land on the moon, the moon hoax, yes. Right. This is Second Amendment kind of New World Order stuff. Yes. Sandy Hook didn't happen. Sandy Hook didn't happen. Right. Others? JFK assassination. JFK assassination. Uh, the Holocaust, didn't Holocaust, didn't Holocaust. Holocaust didn't happen. The Parkland shooting was set up first by someone else. Parkland shooting is set up, right? So, uh, kids are actors. Kids are crisis actors. So we could go on and on and on, right? So here's a short list. Kennedy assassination, birthers. Obama wasn't born in the United States. Truthers, 9-11 was an inside job. UFOs, that the United States government is hiding information about aliens and UFOs, right? 
Uh, FEMA, New World Order, Jade Hell, Martial Law. This is the, we're going to put people in FEMA camps. The ATF is going to take our guns. We can disarm the American population. This is crisis actors around every shooting, right? NAFTA and the Amero. Is it people with the Amero? The Amero was, NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement. There was an argument in the 1990s that NAFTA was leading into what was going to be a tri-union of United States, Mexico, and Canada that would use a new dollar bill called the Amero. In fact, there were reports coming out about red money. And so when we've redesigned our currency, you have recognized redesigned our currency, when people saw stacks of those, the thought was, this is going to be the Amero. This will be our new dollar, right? Vaccines, GM foods, mercury, autism... Uh, weather modifications, chemtrails, the Fed, the moon landing was a hoax, uh, UN conspiracies, Agenda 21. Agenda 21 was signed in Rio de Janeiro. It is the UN agenda for sustainable growth, environmental protection, and other things. Supposedly, in the eyes of many conspiracy theorists, this is the bill, uh, this is the plan of radical population reduction to get the population of the, United, of the world down to 300 million using chemtrail, all these things often tie together, right? Um, crisis actor standard, her Bilderbergers, Bilderberg Conference is a conference of world economic and political leaders that is close to the public. Rothschild's widespread population reduction, right? Yes? Sorry, would you be able to share this PowerPoint with us? Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, yes, so many. So I think there are, and it's, as we talked about it, if you wanted to, we could have gone on for another 20 minutes coming up with deeper and deeper conspiracies, right? Or different versions of the same ones. Um, so a wide range. Some of them are spectacular and truly weird. David Icke, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with, David Icke is a British broadcaster, sports broadcaster, who became convinced that the royal family and other world leaders are all actually shape-shifting aliens who are lizards, <laughs> and that, that the, the, the royal families of Europe that are all tied by blood, right? I mean, in World War I, all of the combatants in Europe are all kin. They're all cousins, right? So they're all a family, in a sense, that they are all actually shape-shifting lizards. Um, not believed by very many, but spectacular. There are some that are believed in nearly evergreen, right? The Kennedy assassination. There are Kennedy assassination conspiracy believers of all stripes from all different places, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, others are widespread but keyed into cultural moments, like the birther controversy. The birther controversy was very big news in the late 20 teens, will probably not be huge news 15, 20 years from now. It's not probably going to be the Kennedy assassination. There are some that never take, right? There was an argument that Obama sabotaged the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico for to have new policies against oil use, to push solar power, I, you know. But this one came up, was sampled. Everyone was like, no, and then it kind of went away again, right? So this happens in this kind of life cycle of conspiracy theories. Um, so but rea the reality, and one of the things we have to think about, and the second part we'll be talking about what we do with our students and how we talk to our students about conspiracies and how we talk to our fellow American citizens about conspiracies. One of the things we have to acknowledge as part of this conversation is that conspiracies exist. Um, if you say that conspiracy is a group of people working together often in secret to advance an agenda beneficial to them, then conspiracies are literally everywhere. Every corporation that is coming up with a new rollout of the bacon double cheeseburger with Rio sauce, the 11 herbs and spices in KFC, the secret, uh, you know, the secret formula of Coke. What I mean is people meet in secret to do all kinds of things for their own interests. And right now, maybe less now than in the Cold War, there are people in high-rise office buildings thinking of how to protect you. The CIA, the FBI, Justice Department, there were also certainly when I was a child in the 1980s, living outside of MacDill Air Force Base, there was someone probably not much older than me in somewhere in Russia sitting on an ICBM targeted with my neighborhood, right? There are secret groups working against you and protecting you. We live in a web of secrecy. Not all of it is a conspiracy. But we have to recognize that conspiracies do exist, right? So I think that when we talk about conspiracy culture, when we talk about conspiracies, it seems like we're talking about something that's weird and strange and outside of the mainstream, outside of the way that most of us, let's, because we all generally think of us as a group, 
right? Educated educators who teach people, we are not part of this group, that group is out there. And this is a fringe, strange part of American culture. I disagree. I think that conspiracies is how Americans do politics. It is often the first move. When I heard yesterday, maybe you did too, that Stormy Daniels got arrested, I had conversations with no less than five people about it yesterday who are all of differing education levels from high school to postgraduate medical school who all said they set her up. Who they is, why they set her up, but the first thought is they set her up, right? Right? There's a growing sense in the United States, and I'm going to trace some of these conspiracies from early on in our founding to the present day, of about this is a way that Americans do politics, think politically. And it is also part of our, and maybe other countries too. I don't know that it's just unique to America, but America is what I've studied, and it certainly is a powerful force here. The way we think about politics, whether it is Bernie was rooked out of by a conspiracy of the Clintons, or Trump saying, this is a conspiracy to get me unelected, or all of these simple things, probably down to every local school board of a conspiracy to do one thing or another. Put in a street light, change the hours of the bus drop schedule, whatever, right? So in my own classes, I, I talk about the occult, right? And on one level, the occult is exactly what we tend to think of as the occult. Werewolves, demons, witches, monsters, magic, right? That is the occult. Um, and that's part of American culture, right? I mean, certainly Salem witch trials and other places where this kind of what we tend to think of as sc- scary supernatural beliefs come up. But I actually think there's a big part of the occult in the Latin sense of occultus, of hidden, of an American fascination with hidden knowledge that shows up in our popular culture, that shows up in our advertisements, that shows up in our TV shows. This idea that we are, Americans are haunted by, that the world is not what we see, and the real things that happen and really affect us, the important things are the things that are happening hidden, underground. Hidden, underground, both metaphorically and quite literally, okay? That they, them, are making the decisions. And they, them, are somewhere hidden underground, and we have to find a way to discover what that reality, what reality actually looks like, right? So um, occult thinking, thinking conspiratorially, is how Americans react to the world, how they interact with the world. It is part of our popular culture. You can also look at, for example, if you look at just advertisements. Here are 10 ancient diet secrets that they don't want you to know. That if you watch, uh, certainly I watched a lot of, because I didn't have a lot better things to do, I watched a lot of Oprah and daytime television during the 80s and 90s, right? Here are diet secrets, here are beauty secrets, here are things that your cardiologist doesn't want you to know. Here's the way to eat, and if you eat this way, you'll magically lose weight, and your cardiologist doesn't want you to know that so that you stay fat and have to come and get a heart transplant, whatever, right? But that idea of there's a secret knowledge of a way to do things, and some powerful force wants to keep you from doing that. And that is in politics, that is in culture, that's in popular culture, right? I looked through the TV listings. It is hard to find a night in TV. I would argue that you might not be able to, to find a night in popular culture where one of the major shows on networks is not about exactly this, right? Is not about secret groups of agents stopping underground groups. 24, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? Angels and Demons, X-Files comes back. X-Files was massive in the 90s, right? But again, all of these eggs. Buffy, the idea, I mean, again, I was joking that I was watching um, Downton Abbey with my wife, and I realized about four episodes in that something was missing, and I turned to her and I said, where are the vampires? <laughs> like, how, how, how is it that we're going to go four episodes of a show then, like, no one has superpowers? Like, no, there's no under, like, the Kaiser's not a werewolf? How is this possibly a show, right? So this is what we are obsessed by, right? And it is percolating through our culture in ways that Americans are prepared to think that there is an occult underground world, an occult not necessarily werewolves and vampires, but hidden, that's away from us, that some other people control. This was, came up a year ago, I showed it, and it was, I always try to find things that are more popular, but this was so good I could not use it, right? 
This was on Twitter. Sometimes it's a horrible mistake to let 10-year-olds name their own baseball team. Then again, sometimes they crush it. And the kid has his baseball team, Little League team, is the Illuminati. <laughs> with the baseball back of the jersey being trust no one with the all-seeing Illuminati eye. I think if you would have let me name my bar, or, or, when I was on Ken's Barbershop, which is my actual Little League team when I was 10, we would have never come up with Illuminati, right? So what does it mean to have kids name themselves after, as we'll talk about, a, a, a 1770s Enlightenment underground movement in Bohemia, and to have trust no one as the tagline. Now, partially, this is from the X-Files. This is a joke. This is not serious. Or is it, right? D what does this say about our culture? Um, Joseph Vicinski, who studies conspiracy theories, did a study for his 2014 book and asked, big events like wars, the current recession, and the outcomes of elections are controlled by small groups of people who are working in secret against the rest of us. We'll talk about more on this in our second hour, right? Only 30% disagree. Okay. Kyrie Irving believes the earth is flat. They lie to us, right? So part of this is, I don't want to necessarily make fun of Kyrie Irving, but I wanted to read some of this, right? So this is from the Sporting News, not known as necessarily being deep into conspiracy theories, but uh, this is the, the idea that the earth is truly flat and this is being hidden, okay? So the earth is flat, Irving said matter-of-factly. Irving joins rapper B.O.B. as a notable denier of a sphere-shaped planet. Anytime you have a specific question like, quote, is the earth flat or is the earth round, I think you need to do research on it. I think we would all agree. When asked how he can believe the flat theory, Irving responded, because it is right in front of our faces, they lie to us. Irving also acknowledged that he has been taught his entire life that the planet is round, but thinks logically it just doesn't make sense. And now the words of Kyrie Irving, if you really think about it from a landscape, the way we travel, the way we move, and the fact that you can, can you really think of us rotating around the sun and all planets allied, rotating in specific dates, being perpendicular with what's on with these planets and stuff like this, Irving explained using air quotes when saying the word planets. Maybe the Cavaliers don't need to acquire Carmelo Anthony at the trade deadline. Maybe they need, need Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. I am not here necessarily to talk of, to make fun of Kyra Irving, who literally states Newton's theory of planetary motion as a kind of big scam. But this quote, because it is right in front of our faces, they lie to us. Trust no one. Okay, So, Stefan Diggs from the wide receiver of the Vikings said, well, how mad would you guys be if I said I agree with Kyrie? Well, I don't care. Said Someone responded, you think the earth is flat? And he said, prove that it's not right now. Besides showing me a picture that you got from somewhere, and I'll be a believer. Now, one, this is, we want to not say that here is, we're talking with a wide receiver of uh, the Minnesota Vikings about whether or not the earth is flat, but look at the evidentiary argumentative moves, right? Which is, I don't believe it, they lie to us, show me a picture, but not one you got from somewhere. Because underneath that is a sense, they lie to us. The evidence itself by which we would argue about whether this is true or not is so tainted that it is not accessible. And, an art, and that a circular argument in which the evidence you want to introduce will be immediately discounted because the source you're going to produce it from are the only people who could take pictures from space who are them. We're in a box, an intellectual box. Okay? Um, Richard Hofstetter wrote in 1964 for Harper, so it's an article that you could give to students, and I've given to students. It's very accessible, easy to read, about the paranoid style, and I want to read a little bit. American politics has often been an arena for angry minds, but behind this, I believe there's a style of mind that is far from new and that is not necessarily right-wing. I call it the paranoid style simply because no other word adequately evokes the sense of heated exaggeration, suspiciousness, and conspiratorial fantasy that I have in mind. In this essay from 1964, in the wake of Barry Goldwater and the idea of the John Birch Society. He's writing about this, but he's also going back in history and writes about conspiracy in the 1850s. This is from a Texas newspaper in the 1850s. It is a notorious fact that the monarchs of Europe and the Pope of Rome are at this very moment plotting our destruction and threatening the extinction of our political, civil, and religious institutions. We have the best reasons for believing that corruption has found its way into our executive chamber and that our executive head is tainted 
with the infectious venom of Catholicism. So in the 1850s, there is a worldwide conspiracy against the United States, but it's from the Pope, and it has already infected the presidency. There are many things you can probably say about Franklin Pierce, but I don't think that he was a pawn of the Pope, right? Also, communists. This is Joe McCarthy speaking in the 1950s, which is, how can we account for our present situation unless we believe that men high in this government are concerning to deliver us to disaster? This must be a product of a great conspiracy on a scale so immense as to dwarf any previous such venture in the history of man. So, not just a conspiracy, the biggest in the history of man, and that this is Eisenhower, who won World War II, is actually a secret pawn of the communists. If not Eisenhower, then certainly people high up in the White House and the Truman Administration. The paranoid spokesman sees the fate of conspiracy in apocalyptic terms. He traffics in the birth and death of whole worlds, whole political orders, whole systems of human values. He is always manning the barricades of civilization. He constantly lives at a turning point. Like religious millennialists, he expresses the anxiety of those who are living through the last days, and he is sometimes disposed to set a date for the apocalypse. So I want, he's writing about political thinkers, but as a religious historian in particular, this language really speaks out to me in the language of millennialism and apocalyptic visions. And also when you hear people talk in American politics, they talk about a war of civilization, everything will be over. If we don't have this, a border wall or something else, everything will be gone, will be overridden. That this kind of language of this is the election, that if this election doesn't happen, it's all over because of some dark conspiracy, okay? The Illuminati, we go back into our history, the Illumined Ones, established in Ingolstadt, Bavaria in 1776, founded by Adam Weishaupt, probably not a real name as it translates to Adam Wisehead, a university professor, has organized to advance the goals of the Enlightenment. So the, the Illuminati is a real thing. It was a real organization set up for Enlightenment goals that in 1785, Carl Theodor, the leader of Bavaria, um, issued an edict making, edict making all secret societies illegal. Illuminati fled the country. Government seized their letters and papers and published them, basically showing that they were anti-religious. They, the Enlightenment was often opposed to particularly the Catholic Church, and so this was a reason to expose them. But they show up again in the 1790s in America, and in America that's involved in uh, both a, ca- about to be involved in a quasi-war with France, that's between France and England as they are fighting a revolution. Uh, France is fighting a revolution and England is about to fight a war against France. And America's caught in the middle. And uh, if you l- know about the election of 1800 from Hamilton, et cetera, right? Jefferson was framed as a French revolutionary who will make the streets of America run with blood, and Adams is phrased as a monarchist who will return the United States to England, right? And the Illuminati was seen as a secret force causing the French Revolution. A small group of people in Bavaria who have already been dispersed are often accused in the 1790s of being the secret force behind the French Revolution, okay? Freemasonry. This is a a constant in American conspiracy theory. It comes up again and again. It established in the 18th century, but it claims an ancient connection to the Temple of Solomon. It's an international society of brotherhood with secret signs and symbols of initiation. Do you recognize any of these symbols? Right? The all-seeing eye of Freemasonry that finds its way both onto the American dollar and onto the jersey of a 10-year-old Little League player. Right? Uh, Many of these symbols, the parquet floor, the all-seeing eye, the apron, this is a part of when you look at the language of symbols of American conspiracy theories, these symbols come up again and again, right? And Freemasons are one of those groups. They are pan-national. They are pan-cultural, in which they stretch around the world, secret that have secret rituals, and those rituals may be no more complicated than the Lions Club, in some people's estimation, or part of a secret, radical, Satanist agenda, depending on how you want to turn it. In a sense, it's a secret society we don't know, (laughs) right? Um, this is a list of famous Masonic leaders. It could go on and on. 27 signers of the, of the Constitution. Most of the earliest presidents, Washington, Franklin, Revere, Payne, Monroe, Jackson, Polk, Garfield, McKinley, Roosevelt, Harding, Roosevelt, Johnson, Ford, others. Easy to make the argument if you were willing to connect particular data points that 
the United States government itself is a Masonic plot, right? That the reason the great seal looks like a Masonic symbol is that the Masons are basically behind it all. Um, in New York in 1826, a man named William Morgan tried to join the local Mason Lodge and was turned down. So he said, I'm going to publish a book revealing all of your secrets. He was arrested. When he was released, he never returned home. A body was found in the river in upstate New York. People thought it was Morgan. And there was a full-fledged Masonic panic that the secret society of the Masons was a murderous conspiracy that was attempting to take over the United States. And this was not just a fear that kind of percolated among Americans uh, in upstate New York. It became an organizing principle for a political party. And the anti-Masonic party wins elections in 1832 and 1836, It elects anti-Masons to political office, and its agenda is against people in American government being parts of secret societies. Because if you're a part of a secret society, you're not doing the people's work, and your allegiance is to something else. This was the argument against Kennedy in, in 1960. The argument that Kennedy, as a Catholic, would have to follow the rules of the Pope rather than be served the American people. In a sense, among people, John Birchers and other people uh, opposed to American Catholicism generally, that you could not be both a Catholic and an American president because you either served one master or the other, right? Same thing with the anti-Masons in the 1830s. But if the modern, and I'm not going to, I mean, there are other conspiracies and other things to go through. I'm going to jump ahead now. Because if the way we understand modern conspiracy theories, the way we engage them with our students and with our fellow American citizens, the way we do it now changed. It's not this. Remember, most of these so far are external things, right? The Pope is influencing us from the outside, right? Bankers are influencing us from the outside. Masons are from outside the government creeping in. Now, by the modern or age we're in now, many times it's the American government itself. So if the modern conspiracy theories have a birthday, it is in 1947 with the National Security Act of 1947. It establishes the National Security Council. It established the CIA. It establishes the Air Force. The Air Force had prior been part of the Army. It established the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and it creates the CIA, as I said. It's charged with, quote, other functions and duties related to intelligence. That is boring government speak for secret operations, right? Covert ops. The budget of the Intelligence Committee was going to be a national secret. It will be a black budget, because if we let the Russians know how much we're paying for things in the security, they'll have an estimate of how much money we're spending and what we might be spending it on. But this is really important. Because for the first time in American history, the federal government is saying, we are going to have a part of the government that is outside of democratic observation. We are going to have a part of the government that will do secret things that we won't tell you about, that will spend money that we will not reveal, and we will do it to protect us because we have to have secrets to protect ourselves. And that secret state has evolved and grown and grown and involved in things like the Patriot Act when it moves into a whole nother level after 9-11, right? But it has a birthday, 1947. Now, the idea of a secret part of the government that does covert operations in a world of the Cold War, post-World War II that we find ourselves in makes a lot of sense, right? There is a reason to have secrets. There is a reason that you might need covert actions. So it's not that this is somehow wicked on its face, but in a population that trusted the American government implicitly, this is going to be fine. If the people know they trust the government to make the right decisions with the power they give them and they will not abuse it, then having a secret government apparatus isn't a problem. But that is not the country that we are, and it's certainly not the country we are as we move forward, right? This creates a fertile ground for conspiracies. There literally is a box where you can say, the federal government did this, and we know they have secrets and they do things. The defenses against that are, one, humans would never do that against each other. That is not a strong argument, given what we know about what humans would do. It's a stronger argument in the 1940s and 50s to say the American government wouldn't do that. So when you get a conspiracy that says the American government did one thing or another, you say the the American government wouldn't do that. Again, not a big deal in a society where the people reflexively trust the government. 
But it is a big deal, particularly for a group of people who are politically awakened by this event. Kennedy shot, uh, not to shock you, Kennedy was shot in Dallas in November 22, 1963. Right? Afterward, Lee Harvey Oswald is arrested. The president is murdered in the middle of the Cold War. Lee Harvey Oswald is arrested. We got the guy. And then Jack Ruby jumps out of a crowd in front of a row of cameras and police officers a minor league gangster in Dallas jumps out and shoots the person who shot the president in front of national TV. In the context of the Cold War, in the context of knowing that there is a national security state, in the context of the moving, or just about really to be moving, cultural anxieties of the 1960s. So what do they do? They put Earl Warren, the former governor of California and the chief justice at the Supreme Court in charge of the Warren Commission to investigate the Kennedy assassination, This is a bid to say you need to trust us because if there's one person you can trust, it is the chief justice of the Supreme Court, the person who in the country is at the top of our judicial branch. He is going to be in charge of this commission and says he acted alone. One man. The Warren Commission was not believed when it was issued. In November of 1963, 29% believed that one man did it. 52% thought others involved and some had no opinion. As we move into the 1960s and 70s, as the the lack of faith in the United States government increases, as the sense that the government does bad things goes up, as the fear of the United States government increases, that number goes up and up and up. In March 2001, it's at 81%. Did not believe. So what they are saying is... You, we had an investigation, the government investigated, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court came out and said, this is what happened, and at some point in 2001, more than three quarters of the American people go, you're lying. Trust no one, they lied to us. Right? And then there are the revelations of government conspiracies that starts in the 1970s. In the Pentagon Papers in 1971, leaked documents about what the United States was doing in Vietnam. Watergate in 1972 that the president himself is about to be indicted for breaking into the offices of the DNC at the Watergate Hotel. Operation Mongoose, there's investigations, the Church Committee, the Committee on Assassinations, and what they come out with is these things that the United States government was doing. Operation Mongoose, we'll talk a little bit, was to harass Castro. Working with gangsters like Sam Giancana. COINTELPRO was the counterintelligence program that's monitoring people like Martin Luther King that was inserting government agents into leftist organizations like SNCC or the, the, uh, the, you know, the SDS. There were times in jokes that at a time there would be some civil rights or leftist meetings in which half the group was informing on the other half because half of them were working for the NYPD and the other half were working for the FBI. Right? Following and taking pictures of King. The House Select Committee on Assassinations comes out in 1976 and raises doubts itself about the Warren Commission. We find out that the CIA overthrow, helped or aided the overthrow of Iran and Guatemala. Tis, Tuskegee syphilis experiments in which African American men in Alabama are go to a clinic for their syphilis and are not treated so that government doctors can monitor how syphilis progresses through the lifetime because penicillin has been curing syphilis too early without telling them or their partners. Right? I ran Contra in the 1980s that they're moving guns to Nicaragua, to, to right-wing groups in Nicaragua. Project Stargate in 1995. This is the revelation that through the 1970s and 1980s, out of Fort Meade, Maryland, the DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats, Right? Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? Um, you know, that the, the people who designed the V2 that hit London are very soon in Huntsville, Alabama, working on the Apollo program, right? But this is... Project Paperclip, we release all of the, fa- the f- not just the things about the kind of big figures that everyone knew about, but all of the rest of the Nazi 
and many of them parts of the Nazi party, who were snuck, snuck out and into the United States, right? So that argument of, well, the United States government wouldn't do this is beginning to fall apart now, too, right? So Project Northwoods was a proposed secret plan signed by the Joint Chiefs, though canceled by Kennedy, to do a series of false attacks in the U.S. that would be blamed on Cuba to justify military action. It's made public in 1997. So in 1997, when Kennedy comes in, the Joint Chiefs say, we want to invade Cuba, we need to have a false flag operation. So the conspiracy theorists who are talking about this are not inventing it out of whole cloth. It's not like they are, they come up with an idea that no one has ever thought of in the government, right? Mongoose was a series of plans to harass Cubans and uh, Cuban and leader and assassinate Fidel Castro. Operation Dirty Trick was a plan that if John Glenn's space capsule blew up, they were going to blame it on Cuba. So we have these plans, many of them shelved, not used, but someone's drafting them, right? MK Ultra, Rockefeller Committee first reveals that the CIA was working on mind control, attempting to use LSD to influence people to be able to question them, to make them more compliant, or to turn them into double agents if they could use them on Russians. The church committee hands over documents. More are handed over in 1978. They randomly drugged civilians. There was an operation called Midnight Climax in which prostitutes, the Johns coming to visit prostitutes in California and New York would be given LSD and then monitored without their knowledge to see what would happen to them. So you could live fire test LSD on subjects to see whether this was the kind of chemical that would be able to use to give to, for example, a spy in Moldova and see what would happen. Can we moderate? Can we weaponize it, right? And all of this is coming out in the 70s and the 80s and later in the 90s. It all seems so bizarre, so sci-fi, that it undercuts something we would desperately love to be able to say. We would love to be able to say, we wouldn't do that. But it gets harder to say that, particularly to minority communities, when they come up with, when people in minority communities have a theory or an argument, and we'll talk about some of them, to say, we certainly, we wouldn't do that. That's not something that's, that the United States government would do, right? So throughout this period of revelation, one of the things that's so frustrating is that the people who were involved are not punished, right? MK ultra doctors, CIA agents that dose people with LSD, none of them go to jail. People who were in Iran-Contra are found guilty, but then pardoned, and oftentimes find their way back into the United States government, Right? There's revelation without repercussions. And there's a sense that some people are above the law. That yes, the government allowed the small fish to take the fall, but what was really going on was never revealed. And that area, that dark area of we know there are secrets, we know that bad things are done, allows people to come up with conspiracies that simply expound those into new levels. Oftentimes new levels of complication and horror, right? So Skull and Bones. This was established in 1832 at Yale University. It meets in a windowless room on Yale University campus called the Tomb. It picks people who are going to be successful, about 15 of men and now women every year. Have you guys heard of the Skull and Bones? Okay. So there are, this is again, there are societies with secrets, but are they secret societies? And how do they tie into the other things we've talked about, right? So this is the Skull and Bones class of 47. This is a headline from the New York Times, which is Yale, a great nursery of spooks. One of the things you might not know about Yale is that Yale was directly connected through its membership into the OSS and later the CIA. Many of the great leaders of the CIA, many of the people that you know, number of people who are assumed to be the people on the three tramps on the grassy knoll were Yaleys, right? Cord Meyer, James Jesus Angleton, Right? McGeorge Bundy, all Yaleys, all, some of them were skull and bones, some of them weren't, who later went into the OSS and then the CIA. The CIA, at, in 1943, 42 members of that class go on into the OSS. Right? There is a statue in front of CIA headquarters who is Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale was the first spy killed by the British in the, in the American Revolution. I regret that I have one life to give for my country. That, mo- that statue that is in front of CIA headquarters is a model of another statue on Yale University campus because Nathan Hale is Yale University class of 73, 1773, right? Now, 
Again, you move forward and say, well, we get to 2004. You have two bonesmen. One, George W. Bush, whose father was a bonesman, whose father was also the head of the CIA, also the head of a major oil company, whose father's father, his grandfather, Prescott Bush, was also a bonesman running against another bonesman in 2004. So now the arguments are, there's a secret society at Yale that's plugged into the American intelligence agency that's done, like, the guys who are sitting and writing Northwoods, you know, maybe not, but the sense is, they all just came from Yale and played squash together and then said, why don't we have a false flag operation, right? I don't know that that's true, but you see the pieces are there, right? A secret society of wealthy individuals all together planning this. And this is the stuff that conspiracy theor- theorists move. And when they were asked about it in the 2004 election, both of them refused to comment. George Bush saying something to the effect of, it is a secret society and I don't talk about secret societies. Right? So it's a society with secrets. But is it a secret society? Right? Another one is the Bohemian Grove. Has anyone heard of the Bohemian Grove? The Bohemian Grove is a large collection of trees in Northern California, Redwood Forest. It is the site of a gathering every year of political, cultural, scientific leaders who come to the forest, close to the press, and live in the trees for two weeks. Now, this is a, can anyone identify anyone here in this picture? This is 1967 at the Bohemian Grove. Nixon on one side, Reagan on the other. The guy in the middle is Harvey Hancock. He was the campaign manager for Eisenhower and also a big executive at Pan Am. This guy to the left of Nixon is Glenn Seaborg. Glenn Seaborg has 11, discovered 11 elements, was a professor at Cal Berkeley, was also in the Manhattan Project at UC, and also was the co-winner of the Nobel Prize in 1951. So he is a leader of, and later on, moving for peace, and arms control, etc. But these are the kinds of people who are there. Now, is it a problem in America that people have a secret society at Yale that, and with Yale's connection to you know, the intelligence community, is it a problem that they gather in places that are defined as secret, the Bohemian Grove, right? Is it a problem that they are there without press, meeting and chatting? Maybe, maybe not. Is it a problem that they put on robes on one of the first days and have a ceremony in front of a giant statue of an owl in which they burn a human effigy in a ceremony called the cremation of care? I mean, so it's weirder, right? So we have, but so, so when someone who is in, inclined to conspiracy theories sees what the American government has actually done, sees the connections that they can draw, then sees that, like, but wait, they're all wearing robes in front of a giant owl burning a person, a, statue, a, 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 a human in effigy. It gets harder and harder. It gets to be that stuff, which is, at what point is a secret society, a, a society with secrets, a secret society? At what level does it reach the point that we should care? Or this is still, like, you're attempting to put something in a place where it isn't, right? John Ronson wrote a book, Vim, in which the experience is that he and Alex Jones snuck into the Bohemian Grove and got this footage. Okay? Um, and it's a real question. Is this a big deal at all? Right? Because this is the raw material of conspiracies. This is the kinds of stuff, and the raw material for each conspiracy is going to be a little different. The pieces that they're going to mix and match to try and make a conspiracy. But we have to recognize that there is stuff, the raw material is out there for people to make conspiracies. Now, that doesn't make conspiracies real. It doesn't make it work. But we need to recognize that this is the well of stuff that people are drawing from who are coming into your classrooms. Right? All of this information is on YouTube. All of this stuff that when they want to make these kinds of things, these are the raw materials. And if we're going to talk about these with our students and fellow Americans, we need to know some of this history to recognize what's inbounds and what's not, right? So elements of a good conspiracy group, international scope, a state within a state helps. This is the Masons, the Catholic Church, the international banks, the, the maybe even some of these organizations, depending on how you want to define Bohemian Grove. It stretches beyond national borders. It has famous members. If there is a secret society in which the highest ranking member is the, a barber from Muncie, I don't think anyone cares, right? But when you have Reagan and Nixon in a picture, now I'm suddenly, I have, you have my attention. Political or cultural influence, again, a conspiracy of people with no power and no influence, has limited effect. Money, secret rituals, and often sexual abuse. This is a, a somewhat 
disturbing part of a lot of these is that you take people with robes in front of the cremation of care ceremony and you add in a little eyes wide shut, right? And you begin to create something that turns, that involves itself into Comet Ping Pong, right? The piece of place that was alleged to have a pedophilia ring underneath it, right? In D.C. in 2016, right? Occult knowledge or connections and some kind of goal, right? If, if the goal of the secret society is just to get together and have a party, no one much cares, right? So, a little bit about UFOs, and, I, and I'm going to, and I know, but it's because this is a place, and one of the things we need to recognize is that conspiracies don't simply involve politics. They aren't simply about political power or connections made at Yale or the international espionage, those kinds of things, right? Or oil or just money or just those kinds of things. There is a carnival-esque period in which when you trace many of these conspiracies, they're going to move to the fantastic, the unreal seemingly, the unbelievable, the religious, the miraculous, right? So UFOs have been with us a long time. This is the book of Ezekiel. I'm not going to read it all. This is Ezekiel seeing of wheels within wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1 that many people who believe in UFOs point to that we've been visited for a long time. You can go and read it. And it is, if you read it in a particular jaundiced eye or maybe unjaundiced eye, it sounds like a rocket. There's flames and spinning wheels and it moves from side to side and it hovers and it roars. So modern American uh, UFO culture comes from uh, Kenneth Arnold, a civilian pilot who claimed to see objects moving over Mount Rainier in 1947. He said they were crescent-shaped, but they skipped over like saucers. They were never saucers-shaped. They were... They were crescent shaped, right? Now notice, again, we will talk a little bit about how part of conspiracy thinking is there are no coincidences. This is 1947, the founding of the... Now, is that a connection? I don't think so. But in the eyes of a conspiracy theorist, I can tell you that dates and times are going to be very important and they're going to echo, right? So in 1947, a public information officer named Walter Haught issued a press release that the Air Force had recovered pieces of a flying disc near Roswell, New Mexico. Are we familiar with Roswell, right? Roswell has moved. Roswell is an almost unknown air base that no one had heard of prior to this event. And now it is possibly due mainly to the X-Files and other things. It is part of our popular culture, right? They issue a story that they recovered a flying disc. Then they issued a retraction and said they found a, an, a weather balloon, right? But it was off and running. The Air Force investigates UFOs from 1952 to 1970 in Project Blue Book. For those of you of my generation who watched um, the Leonard Nimoy show, um, you know, the, there, all, there were a number of shows investigating Project Blue Book, and this was a very hot thing in the 1970s. To analyze UFO data, Air Force investigated 12,618 cases. Most were explained, but a 701, 5.6% remain unexplained. Okay? So, the UF, so what this reads in the minds of conspiracy theorists is, one, UFOs are real enough that uniformed officers of the Air Force are going place to place investigating them. And two, they are issuing a report in which they're finding some unexplained. It is not much of a step to say this is all a front for clearly men in black going from place to place and covering up UFOs, right? So the next step of alien contact is abductions, right? Betty and Barney Hill is one of the classic abduction stories. It's part of our popular culture. Take in, there's all kinds of UFO shows that are going to involve exactly these kinds of things, right? Betty and Barney Hill saw a UFO on September 19th, 1961 in New Hampshire. They see a craft in figures. They realize that their drive home, normally four hours, took more than seven. This is the missing time that is so much a part of UFO culture. After this encounter, Betty has a long series of nightmares and physical symptoms. Right? After working with a psychologist, a psychiatrist, Betty and Barney claim they remember exactly what happened. A ship was taken, they, a ship landed, they were taken on board, they had, and if I asked you all to write down on a sheet of paper the types of medical exams that were done, everyone knows now, right? right? So we could say, they were probed here and there, this is what it looked like. We've seen it in popular culture that this event, which seems so fringy in the 1960s, has become literally... All of us could have a conversation about what a UFO abduction feels like or sounds like, and we've seen representations of it, right? The Greys become this popular figure, right? And they published a best-selling book in 1966 called The Interrupted Journey. So why are we talking about UFOs? 
Because UFOs come back into conspiracy theories about the government in very interesting ways from all kinds of groups, right? That, you know, by the 70s, people are talking about the Roswell as the smoking gun as the UFO movement, proof the Air Force is covering up alien contact. There are release documents from a group called Majestic 12 that is alleging that there was an agreement at pick your Air Force base, Wright-Patterson, Andrews, in which there were alliances formed between the UFOs and the United States government, right? Bill Cooper is a writer who is a really leading conspiracy voice who's, who's now dead, but he was a leading voice about this deep conspiracy in the government, that there's a conspiracy that the government had made a deal in, in, in agreement with aliens in exchange for technology to allow aliens to kidnap and torture American people. And that the abduction movement, the UFOs, the CIA, all of this is a cover-up of a giant UFO arrangement, right? So it combines the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, the New World Order, and other groups into a kind of super conspiracy. And this is not under, unusual. Underneath a lot of the conspiracies that you will discuss in class are bigger conspiracies that the students are not going to discuss because they're arguing about the evidence of one particular little, little bit. And it's important to recognize that these things can grow and spawn, and they invo- involve this kind of carnivalesque stuff, right? In 1990, the Air Force said, okay, we'll release all the documents about this. It was Project Mogul. It was a high-altitude weather balloons to, disco- to de- discover whether Moscow was doing nuclear tests, and it crashed. But do you think this helped? <laughs> Right? The, the issuing of more things was only was taken in the UFO community as, look how close we're getting. They're now trying to recover the cover-up because we're about to uncover it. We're about to blow this thing wide open. And the more the government said, no, here are more documents, the more they looked at it and said, these documents are so fake. I can't believe these guys are so scared. We, are, we have them on the run. So the effort to engage with the conspiracy at this point only leads to in, make the conspiracy stronger as a sense of, well, we're totally justified, right? So there's other arguments, right? There are other arguments that the UFO conspiracy is a conspiracy, a conspiracy of the Air Force. So the Air Force is putting out stories about UFOs so that when people see test aircraft in the air, they don't say, oh, that's the F-37 stealth fighter. They say it's a UFO, And so this is a cover-up to get people to believe in UFOs so they aren't paying attention to what's really going on in areas like Area 51. Area 51 is an area on a government map that no one knew about prior to conspiracy theorists saying that that is Groom Lake where they're testing the the UFOs that they got from the aliens by allowing them to abduct people and take their bodily organs, right? But have you guys heard of Area 51, right? So there's a thing that you know about that's on a government map, literally listed as Area 51, because the name is top secret, because we have a national security state that takes large parts of the United States territory and says, this is Area 51. We can't tell you what we're doing here. We can't tell you what we're spending here, but it's to keep you safe. Trust us. And and I understand you need to test aircrafts, and I don't have a problem with that. But as it plays into this conspiracy theory, it is the raw stuff to allow this stuff to go on, right? The other one is that the UFOs are a cover-up because what they're really doing is they're, they are taking people and probing them and torturing them and doing medical experiments on them or their cattle. Cattle mutilation comes in here now. But the cover-up is, rather than it being black helicopters of the United States government kidnapping people, drugging them and torturing them to do medical experiments on them, instead, it is UFOs. So whoever's out in the cattle ranch gets mad at UFOs and not at the United States government. So yes, it's a conspiracy, but it's a conspiracy of a conspiracy hiding a bigger conspiracy. <laughs> these are the mazes. These are the ma- wheels. These are the, the, mag- the, the mazes we go down, right? So again, these might seem silly, but they show how conspiracy theories expand and darken as they move forward, Right? From a government covering up technology or covering up something they've seen in the sky to the wholesale torture of Americans, right? Oftentimes, these things will move 
in a religious way. That this plot of the UFOs, that the UFOs are not aliens from Andromeda, but that they are in, se- in fact Luciferian beings, right? That religion is going to come involved in some of these conspiracies. And it's going to be very common depending on which conspiracies we're looking at, right? So journalist Michael Kelly argued in 1995 for what he called fusion paranoia. It was a union of the radical left and right, which are often seen as very distinct groups. But a union of them in the shared fear of one thing above all, the boundless, cabalistic evil of the government and its allies. That as you go to the left and the right, you find that the villains become the same, and it's quite often the U.S. government. So that what we think of, there, there had been leftist movements like the Weathermen. There were um, leftist movements, the Red Army faction in Europe. But there are also the growth of right-wing movements, patriot movements, militias, the order, Aryan nations, posse comitatus. Both of these groups could get together and agree on nothing about the political outcomes they want. But they both agree that the target that they've chosen is the United States government. That it is oppressing both the rights of African Americans, whether you want to look at um, you know, Philadelphia and the, the, the battle in, in downtown Philadelphia, or you want to look at right-wing movements in Idaho, they are all identifying the exact same enemy. That is the national security state and all of the conspiracies of the federal government. Right? In 1991, George H.W. Bush, Bonesman, Yalesman, former head of the CIA, comes forward and gives a speech about the New World Order. Many people who heard that said, well, that makes sense. The Soviet Union has just fallen. We have had a 50-plus year Cold War in which we split the the, the world between communist and capitalist. Now one of those is gone. It is time to remake the world, and the phrase a New World Order seems utterly unremarkable. I can guarantee you, for other people listening with different ears, the Bonesman H.W. Bush, former director of the CIA, declaring a new world order is a message to his Skull and Bones alumni in the secret brotherhood, right? For these people, Ruby Ridge, which was Randy Weaver uh, in in Idaho getting delivered a warrant, the FBI and other uh, agencies were attempting to use him as as a witness or as a a source against the Aryan nations he didn't want to. They were going to arrest him on gun charges. And it turned into an armed standoff in which his wife and, and other members of his family are killed. Waco in 1993, the standoff in Waco, Texas, for 51 days around the Branch Davidian compound. Again, combining the federal government, religious believers, the Branch Davidians, who have an end-of-the-world message about the coming apocalypse, like many American religions, including the one I was brought up into, Southern Baptists, had this belief in the federal government then rolls in, acting the role of the government that they would see them play in the book of Revelation that turns into a 51-day standoff and ends in mass death and an invasion by an incursion into the FBI and ATF saying, this has gone on long enough, that turns into a fireball that ends up killing lots of people, right? All of these things in the context of the national security state, of UFOs, of the American government that's hiding it, of both left and right seeing the American government as the fault, as the problem, the revelations of the 1970s and the 1980s, and now the declaration of a new world order, a standoff in Ruby Ridge, are they coming for our guns, a standoff against religious people in the Branch Davidians who are a compound, again, that you have accusations of sex and religious radicalism, and now surrounded by the United States government that ends in a fireball, the sense that this is a natural first step to suppress and exterminate the American people. And there might be a lot of different versions of exactly what the conspiracy are. Which of this melange of Lego pieces of conspiracy I've laid out for you how they're putting them together, but they all come to some similar conclusions of the fault of the United States government. Trust no one. They lie to us. And it ends in Oklahoma City. Well, it doesn't end. It's a mid... Timothy McVeigh is at Waco. There's footage of him selling stickers anti-governmental stickers on the back of his car watching Waco. And when he, he blows this up, and Ed knows this as well as anybody, 
Right? He makes a statement that this, he is a war that the United States government has declared war in 1991 in Ruby Ridge, 1993 at Waco, and this is the next act. That he sees this as pushing back against a federal government out of control that is part of a long, detailed, oftentimes anti-Semitic Aryan nations conspiracy theory about what has happened to the United States government. Pick your pieces from the Lego box of Masons, Jewish bankers, and put them together. But this event is coming out of that conspiracy theories, right? And coming out of the actions of the United States government that have allowed these conspiracy theories in many ways to, and not to fault them, right? Understanding, maintaining a secret state, a national security state and intelligence organizations is allowing these, a lot of these claims to be made. And also the actions of the things that were done in MK Ultra and Northwoods and these other things that are coming out makes it harder and harder to make the case we'd love to make, which is we would never do that, right? So this is Gore Vidal. He is on the left. He's a longtime leftist critic of American empires, he said. And he wrote about the shredding of the Bill of Lights. He declared Vicky and Sam Weaver, shot at Ruby Ridge, as victims of, quote, cold-blooded federal murder and the Waco fire as, quote, FBI slaughter of the innocents. He wrote that, quote, most of today's actual terrorists can be found within our own governments, federal, state, and municipal. I'm not sure if you would say that post 9-11. It seems like a strange thing to say. But it does tell you where Gore Vidal is as far politically as Timothy McVeigh could be, right? He's friend of the Kennedys, like deep within the democratic structure, but is also a critic of the United States, and they become pen pals when Timothy McVeigh is in prison. And in their letters, they correspond on how much they have in common and their beliefs, right? And this is tying into 9-11 being an inside job, right? This is, it is unsurprising given what I've laid out, all of the pieces in the Lego box that are there for our students or fellow Americans when they go searching on YouTube or they watch a show or hear a talk. These are the things they're putting together and to come to the conclusion that this is an inside job. This is four years after the revolution that they had actually discussed a false flag operation in Project Northwoods that they never did. But the claim that Bush knew echoes claims that FDR was behind the Pearl Harbor attack, that he so wanted to get involved in war in Europe that he allowed either allowed Pearl Harbor to have or actually took a stronger hand in it in a even harder to prove conspiracy, right? So, so many of these um, claims about 9-11, and Noah will get into them in much more detail, that there were planted explosives, that there was no plane that hit the Pentagon, moving to levels of Luciferianism, that these were, these were actually missiles and not planes with holographic planes around them, depending on how far you want to stretch the kind of unreality and the the bounds of reality that they're going to use. But these are important issues and part of a debate, right? The debate about 9-11, and no one can talk about it, part of it is evidence. And depending on who you're talking to, they might just be having an evidential debate. What would it take? How does a building collapse? Will steel melt? These kinds of things. But there are some people for whom that debate about the evidentiary basis of 9-11 or any one of these is a cover for a deeper anxiety. The anxiety of they lie to us, trust no one. And that the conversation about 9-11 is only the tip of an iceberg of all of this other stuff that's behind it, of how we think about democracy, how we think about how the American government works, and our relationship to it. This is all for the first part, and we'll move to the second part after the break. But we can have some questions if you'd like. Uh, Do you want to do... I think they need you to have a mic... Don't panic. You'll hold it. Don't panic. Okay. Um, so, uh, do you? Do, oh, this is weird. Okay. Do you see a difference um, between the conspiracy theories that, from what I can tell, seem to be very much like white men distrusting other white men, mm. and the well-founded distrust that many communities of color have for a government that has, you know, consistently oppressed? and killed them over and over again. Is there a huge I difference? think you're absolutely right, and I would advise you to stay tuned for the next hour. So, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about it, right? There are, I mean, that the claim that we're going to talk about how conspiracies break down racially and the types of conspiracies there are. But absolutely, given the long history of what 
American government and Americans in power and white society. I mean, right, slavery. So is it a uh, white American male phenomenon, I guess, I wonder? Um, I think that's a great question. No, no, so I think well, what I would like to say is I would like to address that question in the next hour. Okay. But, but let me say that had I not thought of that question, it would be a truly devastating great question. But yes, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, to what extent is this solely in an American phenomenon? Like, can you speak to if this exists internationally at all? I can try to. I think it is, there are, consp- I don't think it is an American phenomenon. I think if you look at other governments, particularly the Soviet Union and communists, were rife with conspiracies. When you have a, I think any place you have a government that is not responsive or secret parts of the government in which the, how the function of political governments and political economy isn't clear, I think you have conspiracies. I think even in a little league, in a fantasy football league, you have conspiracies where someone's like, well, I can't believe they want to switch to PPR. There's a conspiracy, right? So I think it's partially naturally in us. I also think that one of the things that make it, and again, I'm talking without evidence, so I'm just kind of, so recognize that all of this could be revised by better scholarship. Um, I think one of the things that makes us particularly rife post-1947 is the massive power of the United States. Like, we talked about a great conspiracy matters. You have important people and a lot of money. America has a lot of money and huge power and the ability to power project in ways that if you were, say, Sweden or Lithuania or Belize, if Belize has a lot of horrible ideas, I'm not sure that they're having a whole lot of effect. But America has a worldwide empire. And again, I'm not to call it an empire, but we are in what, 100 countries? We have military bases around the world. We have nearly unlimited capital. Economic system flows right through the city of New York. We have the most powerful, biggest, most expensive military in the world. We have satellites. We went to the moon. There is, if there is a country, with the possible exception of the Soviet Union, that has the power to do bad things if it is inclined to do bad things, it's the United States. So the fact that America has confessed to doing some bad things and it has the means and the opportunity, right? Again, if Belize says we have a plot for worldwide domination, I'm not sure where that goes other than, wow, some of the people in Belize are really messed up. But if Belize had a worldwide power projection possibility, then those conspiracies can get a lot more... I mean, there are... At Weather Mountain or the Greenbrier or Cheyenne, there are giant underground complexes that are dug, that are bomb-proof. We have an entire infrastructure that was designed to accept the fact that we were probably going to be in a nuclear war. We have laws drawn up that allow certain parts of the government to be completely non-democratic, which in the eyes of some people are like, well, see, we already have the plan. All we have to do is announce a national emergency and we can dissolve this or do this or do this. Plans that were made up in the middle of the Cold War. So America is in a p- position because of its power and its um, extent and its reach that those conspiracies can be truly scary in the way that conspiracies about other places might not be. But I do think that, I think if having been a teenager, anytime you get three people together, two of them are plotting against the third one. That might be unfair, but I think, so conspiracy is not that rare. Yeah. Hold, hold a second. Oh. In recent years, it feels like there's more and more of a conversation about how people are only reading news that supports what they already think, sure. and people are looking for information that's already supporting what their mindset is. So how? Because like I, I'm not a believer in conspiracy theories like at all. But I'm looking at this and I'm like, sure. Like if you're trying, if you're trying to prove there's a conspiracy, you can always find that one detail where you're like, well, this part hasn't been solved. Right. Whereas there are a lot of people would be like, yeah, because it's nothing. Yes. Like other people are looking for that and they're always going to gravitate towards that. Is that a part of it? But then also, to what extent is it like people not taking responsibility for like? other like actions that are happening like oh like we're not going to say that this is what's really happening so we're going to like and we don't want to admit to what might be the problem and sure. we're just going to go with the conspiracy because that's easier than like thinking what actually might be a problem in addressing it oh i think that's exactly right and i think again we're going to talk about this in the second half which is that what attracts what is the attractive <laughs> part of conspiracy theories like what is the right i mean a conspiracy theory isn't simply just it's very seldom 
the best answer for the given evidence, right? So there's other things going on. What is emotionally attractive about conspiracies? What is um, politically attractive about conspiracies? And you're right. I mean, the part of it is the world's super complicated, and we want to have answers for it. And there are times in which, because of that complex nature, conspiracy theories seem easier and more attractive because they explain more things. But we're going to talk a whole lot more about that. But I do also think that the division of news in which you consume only that news which seems to most agree with what you believe leads to a lack of contrary um, opinions and examples. So, yeah, so I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, please. Uh, Yes, you've been talking about... um conspiracy theories that people have about government yeah but in this administration it's like they are the ones promoting some conspiracy theories yes like the birther movement um trump also mentioned uh ted cruz his dad being um oh yeah involved in the jfk assassination uh, Michael Flynn and the pizza, uh, sure. Hillary Clinton, oh, and, and, it, yeah, I and mean, so com- many others. Yeah, com- and, and that is extremely scary that some of the followers, because Trump has a lot of supporters, might actually believe those conspiracy theories be- because they're coming from from them, from him. No, I think you're right. If you look at Comet Ping Pong, right, a guy shows up at a rifle. I was going to, I mean, we could talk about it if you wanted to in some detail about the imagery and the way symbolism is used there. But I think what, so... I mean, there's no way around the... I mean, the, one of the things in, that achieved political takeoff for Donald Trump was his opposition to Obama and pushing birtherism, right? I mean, he is attached to that early on as a kind of... And I don't think it's the only reason he won, but it was, certainly was a reason. I would actually say that part of this is... We start... I think that many times, and we've talked about this in various ways, we see conspiracies as weird, separate, apart from the way... People think about stuff, and I think Trump, to his credit, said, there's a lot of people who think like me, or there's a lot of people who think like this, and I can motivate them and mobilize them to become active political participants in a way that other politicians would think, well, I won't ever talk about that because it's horrible or untrue or no one's going to respond to that or people will think I'm a nut. And I think Trump didn't have that opinion, right? I'll sliver. Uh, I have a very quick question, then sure. a longer one. Quick one is, um, building off of Rick's question from earlier, are you going to talk about the role of women in conspiracy movements? A little bit. Um, there is, surprisingly, if you look at the, the, most of the scholarship of it, women, there's some scholarship on, women, on conspiracy belief among women, but much less on conspiracy perpetuation among women. And most of the, not, perhaps not surprising, it's very masculinist and, in fact, anti-feminist. And so, um, in fact, depending on which conspiracy you're looking at, things like the feminist movement of the 1960s is seen as one of the things that they are acting against, particularly in Aryan Nations and Posse Comitatus and a lot of these right-wing movements are very much about traditional female values. And so there isn't really a space for them to be the kind of engineers of... of, But, but, you know, there's not a lot of work on... on, There's a lot of work on women in radical movements or women in extreme movements, but much less on women as leaders of those movements. Well, why? Like, why do you think they're not involved in conspiracy? Because I I agree. I think I almost never think of women. Right. I always think of men being like, oh, well, this is all a conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, you're right. Right. It's just Um, not... So, But I will say that that's not entirely true because in some depending on what community you're looking at in some groups, to the degree that religion is an important factor, for example, Randy Weaver's wife had visions of an apocalypse, had visions of going to a mountain, and that she was really the religious, she was in some ways the leader of the family all the way around, was that then they moved to Idaho because they thought the apocalypse was coming. So where religion comes into this, there very, very often is a powerful woman figure on that, though there's also a very much a masculinist, depending on which group we're talking about, masculinist warrior culture that puts women into the background on that. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, there, there is. I mean, there certainly is. Though we don't, I mean, Phyllis Schaffley probably is a conspiracy theorist, but I think we don't tend to think of her as that. But there are women, Eagle Forum, and these kinds of places, um, that are pushing some of these things. So I think it's right. But, there's, but you're right. But they certainly is, I can say that in the literature, they play a 
perhaps very much undeserved small role that I think they deserve a lot more attention. Do you have a second one? Um, yeah, so I was thinking about... <laughs> so when you were talking about like how like the people, like the power of the United States like engenders conspiracy theories, that I was thinking about like North Korea and how the entire population is like brainwashed to believe that like they're the most absolutely powerful nation in the world and they're perfect and like everyone else is like this horrible person and this like screwed up place. Um, but you don't really have conspiracy theories there. I, I, yeah, so, I, don't, I mean, it's hard to know, right? We don't know, but it's a great question. I, there is a, also, I think what you have there is a cult of personality, but you also have the idea that Kim shot, played around a round of golf and had 18 hole-in-ones, right? Or when he was born, <laughs> well, when he was born, like there was a double eclipse and five rainbows. Like, there's, so there is that kind of, that kind of myth building that I don't know that I would quite do, like I don't know that it's quite a conspiracy, but it is interesting to think about what in those closed communities that are, dominated by a cult of personality, the kinds of things you have. So is brainwashing the solution to no conspiracy theories? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? Um, you, you showed that they've been around forever, but I was just wondering, have they kind of changed and morphed and grown since the advent of the Internet and people to be able to communicate instantaneously and around the world well, with It's a really other? interesting question, right? Um, that there are the kind of techno prophets who say that once we'll all be able to talk to each other, we're going to move to this new level of intelligent discourse. And then there's the internet, um, <laughs> which is not that. Um, yeah, so I think the internet has been key to this. I mean, it, it's, it, you know, again, if we looked at, say, Comet Ping Pong, which starts on a Reddit board in November 4th, and within a week it's become on TV, on Fox News, talking about this event, this thing, in which there's this you know, allegation that there's a pedophilia ring underneath this pizza place in D.C., frequented by um, powerful politicians, particularly Democrats, linked to, to John Podesta's emails being leaked, in which they talk about pizza. Because my sense is, if you have a bunch of political volunteers... You buy them a lot of pizza. But people on the internet going through, he's saying pizza so much, you know that pizza is code for pedophilic sex with children. And that's what they're talking about. So, I mean, so the internet allows that community, that, that idea, which is what it allows is one person or a group of people have an idea. And it might be a joke. Like, it might be just for the lols. It might be just a, like, they're playing a joke on somebody. But they started into the Internet, which now can spread so rapidly that everyone who has an inclination about that or an interest in that can now be part of that community. And it spreads to the point that, again, less than a month later, on November 3rd, my guess is outside of a six-block area at Comet Pink around the pizza place, no one's ever heard of this place, right? But it turns into the idea that all these businesses are linked and there's this pedophilic symbolism that's showing that and there's underground tunnels and all of this is put together and there's children in cages underground being kept so that powerful politicians can have and the elite can have sex with children. And it gets to a guy in North Carolina who I guarantee you a month earlier has never heard of Comet Ping Pong. And he gets an AR-15 type rifle and he drives to do what he called self-investigation and walks into the restaurant and shoots into the floor and gets arrested. I mean, that, that kind of speed in which something can go from literally not existing, not a, just popularizing a conspiracy theory, but literally not existing and being created on the Internet by the activity of people who are putting in, some of them are, cl- there's a picture of Obama at Comet Ping Pong in which he's at a, First of all, isn't actually, maybe he's actually holding a ping pong paddle, but it's in like the north part of the White House, like the red carpet with a ping pong table in the middle. But it says Obama at Comet Ping Pong. I mean, I don't know who believes that. Some, it might be someone makes it as a joke and passes it to a friend who then puts it on this you know, Reddit page and then it's in the kind of, you know, it's a new kind of conspiracy disease vector in the kind of mind of the body politic. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we'll, we'll talk about it some more, but I think you're right. I mean, I, the Internet certainly has allowed communities that otherwise communicated much more slowly to communicate much more rapidly and evolve much faster in a way that's kind of surprising and shocking. I mean, I, I unfortunately spend more time engaging with people on the Internet 
that I definitely don't want to meet in real life. Um, but but it's, it's, and it's shocking how fast these things can metastasize. So, yeah. One more question before break. Okay. Um, so, you know, going to what you just said and also, you know, something that struck me as you were talking about the uh, history of the, like, the Illuminati and the breakup of the Illuminati and how there becomes this um, evidence kind of how they, get, how they gather evidence and create argument toward the argument that they want mm-hmm. to make. Um, which made me think of the idea that, you know, in a conspiracy situation that there is no trusted source then because, like you said, your source is contaminated by people who want you to see or, you know, what they want you to see. Um, which, kind of, which really led me to kind of this, the modern era of kind of you have your truth, you have your facts, I have my truth, I have my facts, and kind of made me wonder if a lot of this comes down to like, like just the idea that beliefs don't need proof. Because you have what you believe and I have what I believe. Right. I mean, so we're, we're in, I mean, imagine if we go back, right, to Stefan Diggs, right, who is an unusual person to put in, let's have an evidentiary argument about how we think of knowledge, and let's turn to Stefan Diggs, wide receiver of the Vikings. But the idea is, you can, I, I, go ahead and prove it to me right now, but don't give me a picture that you got from somewhere because they lie to us, right? What we're in is this weird evidentiary space in which technology has made it even pre-Photoshop. The idea that the evidence you're giving me is fake because I have decided that NASA is a front to fake the moon landing. So the pictures you're giving me as evidence can't work as evidence because I've already decided that because they are part of the conspiracy, none of that evidence can be trusted. So there is no evidence. And I think we're at a point now, this is, I was an English major as well, undergrad, and we talked about postmodernism and moving past truth. And the idea was that this was going to be really great because we were, un- un- we were overthrowing master narratives of, of kind of, you know, inherent ideas of gender or power or capitalism or these kinds of things. And we would be free out of these master narratives and we'd be in a post where the kind of the powerful wouldn't have, be able to control the narratives. Well, we're here. So this is what it looks like, right? I mean, in an area where you say, how do we engage and talk about these issues when we won't share a worldview of what counts as evidence? And when we are in an area, and again, this is where it moves towards religion, right? You would never say to someone, and I grew up, and I say, I believe the Lord Jesus died for my sins. You're like, well, give me that evidence. Right? There are some claims that are safe in our culture away from evidentiary claims. We're not going to have that argument. Right? Or maybe we will, but it's going to be uncomfortable. But that sense of belief has moved in many cases beyond what we would think of as traditionally religious questions. But I would also argue from some of this, many of arguments about conspiracies are religious questions. They function like religious questions, not like political questions. And that can put us in a really gray area as we try to debate them. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we'll talk about it more. So. Steve, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Be sure to check out our Book Notes Plus podcast. This week's program is a conversation with Professor Chester Bo Morgan on his book, Redneck Liberal, on Theodore Bilbo. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.